Hi everyone, this is Robert and welcome to IDG Live. Today we are looking at Sam Gamgee, uh, the greatest of all the characters in Middle Earth. I will unashamedly put my bias out there to start with. I think he's an amazing character and as we will um, consider later on, I think that Tolkien also considered him to be, uh, in his words, the chief hero of this story. But we will unpack all of that as we get through it. Um, We'll uh, give a bit of an overview of who he is, what his history is as we go through this, um, just to start with. And then also I'll try and pick up as many different questions as I can from the chat, also from my patrons. Uh, but let's get into it. Who is Sam Gamgee? Well, he was born in the year 2980 of the Third Age um, to Hamfast Gamgee, his father, and uh, I always forget her name, apologies, Belle Goodchild, uh, his mother. He had five siblings and um, he grew up at Three Bagshot Row. Now that is in Hobbiton. It is the road that just sort of goes around the bottom of the hill that we have Bag End on. And his father, who we know as Gaffer Gamgee, was a gardener. He was a gardener to, at the time, Bilbo Baggins, who lived um, up the top of the hill in Bag End. And um, it seems that Sam had a pretty idyllic childhood growing up in the Shire. He used to play around the whole area and um, he was taught, we're told that he was taught rope making by his his uh, family, by his uncle in particular, and also gardening. His father was the gardener. He slowly took over the family business of gardening. His siblings went on to other things, but he was the person who took over doing the gaffer's job, uh, doing the gardening for Bag End. Now, um, during this kind of upbringing, childhood, uh, he clearly became a favourite of Bilbo. And Bilbo taught him to read. He taught him about elves. He taught him about his adventures or told him stories of his adventures. And this left Sam with this great love, this idealized view of the world. He desperately wanted to see elves. He wanted to go out and uh, oliphants. He wanted to see oliphants. He wanted to see the wider world. His Parents, though, particularly the gaffer, were very, very focused in on the local area. And so um, Sam, although he travelled perhaps up to 20 miles away from Bag End, away from Hobbiton, um, that was considered, certainly by the gaffer, as just an indication of that you know, he was just a little bit odd. He'd been taught a little bit too much by that Bilbo with all of his, his odd travels. Um, but Sam had this strange mixture of wanderlust, wanting to see the world, but also love, deep abiding love for the Shire. So uh, that's how he grew up. And as his father grew older, um, he took on more and more of the tasks um, of uh, being the gardener to uh, Bag End. And obviously, Bilbo left. Frodo took over and he became not just the gardener, but a, a good friend to Frodo as well. We'll dig into that relationship a little bit more later. Um, where we come into this story, though, um, I think is with um, Sam going to the pub. <laughs> he went to the, the, the Green Dragon Inn and... Um, he was there and he spent, uh, we read about it in The Lord of the Rings, he spent a, a, an interesting evening when he was talking about how he'd heard these rumours about tree men in the Shire and he was there with Ted Sandyman and Ted Sandyman was rubbishing this and they had a good old chat down the Shire and Sam worked his way back from uh, the Green Dragon Inn. And as he was heading back home, he obviously had to pass by Bag End and he spotted that Gandalf was there and talking to Bilbo, not, not Bilbo, to Frodo. And he thought, I'll have a little listen in. At which point we should just quickly back up a moment. I did a video about a month ago, I think maybe even less, The Conspirators of Bag End. 
which was trying to unpack something that they left out of the films completely, but I think was really important to help us understand the uh, the beginning of the Lord of the Rings and also the role of the hobbits, uh, the other hobbits in the Lord of the Rings, which is that whereas in the films you get Merry and Pippin, for example, they just literally bumped into Frodo and Sam on their way out of the Shire and that's how they joined the adventure. It, that's not how it was in the books. In the books, Merry starts to get suspicious a long time earlier, a long time earlier. He sees Bilbo one day uh, wandering down the lane, spotted uh, the Sackville Bagginses. No one likes the Sackville Bagginses, Bilbo in particular. And he muttered to himself, he pulled something from his pocket, put it on his finger and disappeared. And then when the Sackville Beckinses had gone, suddenly Bilbo reappears and puts the shining object back into his pocket. Merry gets suspicious, but he doesn't say anything. And what carries on from there is this long kind of reconnaissance program that goes on. Merry expands the group of people that he lets into the secret. Pippin, his friend Fred Edgar Bolger, Fatty Bolger, we know about, they realise that Bilbo, he put on the ring, he disappeared. Frodo now has the ring. And they see that Frodo is wandering around the Shire thinking, oh, is this, is this the last time I'm going to see this view, these trees, this valley? Frodo's very new romantic <laughs> in, uh, in his last uh, few months in the Shire. And they recruit Sam. They recruit Sam to be what they call their chief spy, the person who's going to keep an eye on Frodo and let them know what's going on, because they didn't want Frodo just to disappear like Bilbo did. And they wanted to help him. And so Sam, who, let's face it, is coming back from the pub. He's had a couple of drinks by this point, um, but he's keeping in mind, uh, I should, I should listen in on what Gandalf, we know what Gandalf's like, we should listen in to what Gandalf is saying to Frodo. So he listens in and he hears something about a ring, something about a dark lord and the end of the world. Um, when Gandalf says that Frodo should go away, leave the Shire, that's when Sam gasps. Gandalf hears him grabs him in through the window and from that moment on Sam is in on it and Gandalf says you know you're going with Frodo um, so Sam kind of admits some of this to his co-conspirators he doesn't he has to promise not to say much to Gandalf and to Frodo but he admits a bit of it so Sam is the reason why Merry and Pippin know so much at the beginning of the book. Then when we get the journey across the Shire, uh, that's with Pippin and Sam helping Frodo leave the Shire, ostensibly heading towards Crick Hollow. It's Sam is going there, he tells everyone, as his gardener, as uh, Frodo's gardener, and people believe that and accept that. That's what his job was and they knew he was Frodo's friend and so he was heading off as well. Sam however was obviously in this position of knowing both sides. He knew why Frodo was heading off and he also knew that Merry and Pippin understood. Still they get through the Shire a few close shaves with uh, the Black Riders and they make it to Crick Hollow and at Crick Hollow that's where Frodo um, he tries to tell his friends what's going on, and they basically say, well, we know already. Now, Sam's a part of this. Sam agrees to go, not just agrees to go with them, but says he wants to go with him. Um, one thing that happened during that um, trip through the Shire before they get to Crick Hollow, that is probably worth mentioning. Again, it wasn't in the film, so we don't really talk about it all that much. But they see elves, elves who have been 
Um, they'd been over to the Tower Hills. They'd looked west. This was something a lot of elves do before they actually, pardon me, actually head over to the west, before they actually sail west. They go, there's a Palantir there in, in one of the towers there. And they go, they gaze through that and gaze west. And these were elves who've just come back from there. And Sam loves this. This is all he's dreamt about, actually meeting real elves. And they spend the evening with the elves. And Sam sleeps well, and he wakes up the next morning. And, uh, and we read this. Um, and Frodo asks Sam something along the lines of, do you, you still want to come with me? And Sam says, after last night, I feel different. I seem to see ahead in a kind of way. I know we are going to take a very long road into darkness, but I know I can't turn back. It isn't to see elves now, nor dragons, nor mountains that I want. I don't rightly know what I want but I have something to do before the end, and it lies not in the Shire. I must see it through, sir, if you understand me. So when he first set out, there was definitely a part of him that was just, I'm going here for an adventure. This is what Bilbo taught me about. It's to see elves. It's to, it's to experience the world. But having seen these elves, having talked to them, having understood perhaps a little bit more about the dangers, he gets this slight change of heart and it's more i've got a role here i don't know what it is i don't know anymore but i know it's beyond the shire and i know it's about just keeping on going and that is what drives sam for huge amounts of, of what is to follow um then once they've got to crick hollow and they decide to head off through the old forest um, they meet Old Man Willow. Again, not in the films. Um, Old Man Willow captures the hobbits. The hobbit, intriguingly, who seems to be um, most resistant to this is Sam. He's the one who saves Frodo from drowning. Um, he's the one who uh, basically tries to attract, <laughs> attack the tree to try and um, uh, save Merry and Pippin um, to no avail. But all of the fuss that's going on attracts Tom Bombadil. And Tom Bombadil saves them. And Tom Bombadil takes them to his house. And one thing I would pick up from Sam, which is fascinating, is that the hobbits, they didn't sleep badly when they were there, but they had troubled dreams. It was, it was a slightly disconcerting place for them. But Sam absolutely no problem slept all the way through he just so relaxed um hold on to that thought because we'll come back to it in a moment i think it's quite an interesting one they head on um up through the barrowlands they uh, they eventually make their way to brie and to uh, aragorn and when they get bill the pony this is when Sam next really comes to, into his own because he is the person who cares for Bill the Pony. I've done a video recently on, uh, on I say recently, it was quite a while ago now, on Bill the Pony, um, who is a character. Um, Tolkien created him as a character with a character arc. So do check that out. If you're if you're on TikTok, incidentally, I've just I joined TikTok a, a little while ago, um, and I reissued that video i did on youtube over on tiktok so if you want to check that out do um but sam is the person who looks after bill the pony and names bill the pony um and when uh frodo sort of, i was gonna say falls ill that's not really the way to say what happened to him when he gets stabbed by the Morgul blade um, and is dying, being sucked into uh, the Shadow Realm. It's on Bill the Pony, led by Sam, that uh, that Frodo is brought um, sort of eastwards towards Rivendell. When they get to Rivendell, Sam, as we know, he stays by Frodo's side. Um, he... Uh, that happens not to be there when Frodo wakes up, but that's just 
happenstance uh, he spent most of his time while Frodo was unconscious right by his side and Sam all the way through that period when they're in Rivendell he sticks as close as he can to Frodo it's as if he has that realization he had from when he met those elves before it's still there he has he has a role he has a mission he doesn't really know all of what it is but it's clearly something to do with following uh, Frodo and when we get to the Council of Elrond and when it's decided or Frodo says that he will take the ring Sam jumps up and it's like, I'll, I'm going to that line, great line that we get from Elrond is that, yeah, of course, you at least will go because, you know, it's hard to separate you even when one of you is invited to a secret council meeting and the other is not. That's that's straight from Tolkien. And that is the field. All this time, Sam has been there. He's just not let Frodo out of his sight. So he comes along with Frodo. Um, and uh, I, I think the the next point in the story, we know the story so well, so I'm not going to reiterate too much of the story. The next point I would probably make is when we get to Lothlorien. Sam was deeply affected by Gandalf's um, demise. He makes a song for him, uh, which is, and, and this is a, a part of, Sam's character that we see quite a bit of, but we don't often talk about, is he's he's actually a poet, he's a lyricist, in a very humble way. He never kind of pushes it on anybody, but he does come up with songs, and he comes up with a song about Gandalf's fireworks. And this, I think, is very telling of who he is. The characters who come up with these kind of songs often... They're, they're showing their spirit. They're showing who they are as a person. And Sam's songs were about love and respect and honor for other people. And I said, hold on to that thought a little while ago about how Sam slept well at Tom Bombadil's house, because he's not slept well a lot of the time. But here again in Lothlorien, we specifically hear that he sleeps up, that the other hobbits find it hard when they're up on the flats, which is, you know, the, like the wooden platforms high up in trees, the, the hobbits found it hard to sleep, but not Sam. Sam slept really well in Lothlorien. And I think that there's something here that Tolkien is telling us about his spirit, is that he automatically feels when he's in a safe place, when he's with good people and he can relax and just be in that moment in a way that the other hobbits can't. The other hobbits are really focused on all the things that are going on around them. Sam allows himself to be in the moment. He allows himself um, not just to be the good person that he is, but he allows himself to just um, experience where he is. While he's in Lothlorien, though, um, he does, uh, he goes along with Frodo to look in the mirror of Galadriel and he sees the Shire um, being burnt down, being uh, industrialized. This is what is happening. While they're away, um, uh, the ruffians, the Saruman's ruffians, have gone in and they have basically taken over the Shire. Saruman will follow a bit later on in this story uh, into the Shire. But when the hobbits went, that's not long after that, that's when the ruffians went in. And Sam is distraught, but Sam decides to carry on. This is again, another theme we get of Sam's story is where he's faced with something he loves and he has to balance that against doing his duty and following love, following Frodo. He chooses Frodo rather than the Shire. Earlier he had to let Bill the Pony go because he had to go and save Frodo. At some point incidentally I will do a video on all of the times that Sam saved Frodo because there's a lot. Um, he had to let Bill the Pony go because he had to go and save Frodo. Um, so again and again Sam is faced with these kind of which way do I go? 
of these two conflicting things I care about and love. And almost every time Sam gets to go back to the thing that he left behind, uh, which is which is a beautiful little bit of sort of uh, a, a little literary touch there from Tolkien, is that Sam, uh, Sam gets what he deserves at the end of this story. Um, but anyway, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Sam, obviously, when we we get on towards the end, Sam, uh, so the end of the fellowship, I should say, Sam is the one who realizes what Frodo's doing. He's the one who actually understands Frodo in a way that the others don't. They um, they all go running around trying to find Frodo, uh, and then eventually you get Aragorn. Gimli and Legolas just spot them at the last minute on the other side of the river. But the only one who figures out what Frodo is going to do is Sam. And so Sam then goes to follow. Obviously, Sam can't swim. But uh, again, he's he's putting his own safety behind that of uh, following uh, Frodo. So uh, the two of them head on into Mordor. Uh, Sam is always suspicious of Gollum when they meet Gollum. He's always, uh, he he thinks that Faramir is a good person when he meets Faramir. Sam is an incredibly good judge of character, um, which makes him probably, although he comes across so well, probably one of the most idealized characters. We'll come back to why in a moment, but probably one of the most idealized characters that we have in all of the Lord of the Rings. Most of the characters have got these flaws. Sam is at heart a good person, and so therefore his judgments about other people are also good. When uh, they get into Shelob's lair, Sam again saves Frodo's life by um, not killing Shelob, uh, but putting Shelob out of action. Um, he thinks Frodo's dead, and in his great... Again, this is a, I, I felt a tragedy that they left this out of the film. Um, uh, or they didn't leave it out. They, they changed the perspective a little bit to make it a little bit of a... Um, a surprise kind of moment, but Sam goes through the thought process of leaving Frodo behind and taking the ring. And he thinks that he can't he can't do it. He thinks that it's almost hopeless, but he realizes that he has to do it. If he doesn't do it, nobody's gonna do it. And so he leaves Frodo again. This is another time when he leaves something that he loves, cares about, to go on and do what he feels that his duty is, he heads off with the ring, thinking, well, I'm going to try and destroy the ring. I don't think I'll do it, but I'm going to try and destroy the ring. At which point he discovers that Frodo is not dead, and then he goes back and he gives the ring back to um, Frodo. Giving the ring back to Frodo is not something I think we should gloss over. Sam was tempted by the ring. His, his, his temptations are wonderfully about how he could be like the world's greatest gardener. He could have an amazing garden. That's how the ring could try and tempt him. Uh, but uh, he gives it back. The amount of people who actively give up the ring is, um, I'm going to say two, him and Bilbo. Because Frodo fails to give up the ring at the very end. Uh, Gollum never gives up the ring. Sauron never really willingly gives up the ring. Isildur never willingly gives up the ring. So immediately we have to say that Sam, uh, he deserves the title of ring bearer, which he is given later. He carries it for an indeterminate amount of time, certainly quite a few hours, uh, maybe up to a day or so. Um, he wears the ring, he survives he, the, the initial temptation from the ring, and he gives the ring to somebody else. There, there is, uh, uh, we, we, could get, we could talk a long time about whether Sam should, um, uh, would have been able to carry the ring on his own, uh, but there is no doubt that he, more than almost anyone, with the possible exception of Bilbo, um, 
showed great strength in resisting the power of the ring. So um, then the last the last bit of his story, uh, the story of his part of the, uh, the Lord of the Rings, and he gets Frodo to uh, up to Mount uh, Orodruin. He carries him part of the way. Gollum comes in for this final attack. Again, Sam saves Frodo's life. But he also then has pity, mercy on Gollum. It's just something he hadn't really had before, and it always kind of like felt a little out of place for such a, a great idealized good character as Sam. But now he's had this understanding of what it was like to carry the ring. Now he can have pity on Gollum because he looks at him and he knows that's that's the logical conclusion. That's where you would end up like if you carried the ring for such a long time. And that's spared and saved Gollum's life because Sam could have killed him there. And the logical thing from sort of the um, pure uh, uh, logic perspective there is that he should have he should have killed him or incapacitated him in some way, stopped him getting to Frodo. But it turns out that the pity that Sam had in letting Gollum stay alive actually led pretty much directly to the ring being destroyed. Because without Gollum being there, the ring would not have been destroyed. Frodo would not have thrown it in of his own volition. It needed Gollum. This isn't Sam thinking in a very calculating way, oh, I should spare him so that then he can perhaps go and make sure that the ring... No, that's nothing what's going on here. What we have is Tolkien showing the pity from the three uh, Hobbit ring bearers, himself and Frodo and Bilbo. At different times, each of them showed pity and that is what allowed Gollum to survive through to the end. When Frodo, uh, well, when the ring does finally get destroyed, it's Sam who pulls Frodo out. And Sam, who's the one who, um, all this way through, he's he's been thinking not just about how do we get there, but he was also rationing out their food to how do we get back and it's only at the very end when he starts thinking about the end of all things that he thinks well maybe okay there's a massive volcano erupting around me maybe we're not going to escape now but of course they do the eagles come in Gandalf and the eagles come and save them so what happens to him for the rest of his life well when they finally do get back uh, all the way to uh, Hobbiton, we obviously have the Scouring the Shire. The main leaders of the opposition in the Scouring the Shire were Merry and Pippin. But Sam, uh, Sam is a hero, uh, and he uh, inherits from Frodo Bag End. Frodo says, "You can have Bag End," and uh, he marries Rosie Rose. Um, and eventually they have, I think it's 13 children, a lot of children. Um, but he is there to um, escort Frodo, really, up to the Grey Havens and back. The end of the story of the Lord of the Rings is with Sam. I've got a video coming out about this actually very soon, why it ends there, um, which is all about Tolkien's understanding of literature and what the role of hero truly is. Um, but the story ends with Sam. Uh, well, I'm back. Um, that is how the story ends, with him being back where the story started and with his family, and all is well with the world. He is recognised not too long after this, by being made the mayor of Mickle Delving. This is the um, one of only a handful of sort of recognised official posts that you have in the Shire, and this is this is an elected post. It's not 
very much about sort of actually head of government kind of things. It's more a ceremonial role, turning up to big parties and giving short speeches, that kind of thing. But it's a seven year term and he's elected seven times. Um, he is well known, well loved, well respected uh, within the Shire. And Frodo had hands on to him the Red Book. This is the Red Book that Frodo, uh, the Red Book of Westmarch, it becomes later known, that, that Bilbo, first of all, wrote in there and back again. Frodo wrote the story that we have of the Lord of the Rings. Sam himself wrote the last chapter of the Lord of the Rings. And then it got added to over years. He passed it on to his daughter, Eleanor, uh, and it was held in Westmarch, which is how it became known as the Red Book of Westmarch. When Sam's wife Rose died, then after that, Sam heads west and he gets on a ship and he goes over to uh, the Undying Lands. Uh, he has afforded that uh, privilege, really, because he was a ring bearer. The ring bearers were allowed to head west and we don't see it, but... I think we can all imagine that this was in order for him to have a final uh, a final time, a final farewell to Frodo. Uh, the, the Undying Lands, often misinterpreted, but the Undying Lands do not make you undying. It is the lands themselves that are undying. So uh, hobbits would go there and they would grow old and die, but the land itself is beautiful and uh, it is undying itself. So that's Sam Gamgee. I've got one little addendum to all of this, which I, I always find quite uh, amusing, fun. Um, we, we find that Tolkien came up with his names for characters in a for a variety of different reasons. But one of them... Um, when, when we're talking about Sam Gamgee, he, he, he actually knows where the name Sam Gamgee come, came from. And he says, and this is partly for alliterative purposes, because it was uh, Sam Gamgee sounds good on the tongue. But also, um, this was something from his childhood. Um, the, the inventor of cotton wool um, was a guy called Dr. Gamgee. And this is in Birmingham, in England, where he grew up. And so locally, Gamgee was known, was the name for cotton wool. And uh, he was aware of this, uh, but he never thought that this would be, you know, impact on anything. He thought it was just a little bit of inspiration. Then he got this letter, which I've got, this is wonderful. So he got a letter some point in the 1950s, uh, shortly after the Lord of the Rings came out from uh, this gentleman who had not read the book yet, but had heard that there was some character in it called Sam Gamgee. And the person who wrote Tolkien this letter was a Mr. Sam Gamgee. And Tolkien wrote, wrote back to him, and we have that letter. And, and this is what Tolkien wrote back to Sam Gamgee. Dear Mr. Gamgee, it was very kind of you to write. You can imagine my astonishment when I saw your signature. I can only say for your comfort, I hope, that the Sam Gamgee of my story is a most heroic character, now widely beloved by many readers, even though his origins are rustic. So that perhaps you will not be displeased at the coincidence of the name of the name of this imaginary character of supposedly many centuries ago being the same as yours. Uh, which is a lovely little letter to write back to someone. But we also have a a note in his personal journal uh, where he reflects back on that and he says for some time I lived in fear of receiving a, a letter signed S. Gollum that would have been a more difficult letter to deal with um, talking had a lovely <laughs> sense of humour uh, but it sort of just shows uh, how his inspiration comes from the real world and um, that, uh, I think, is a part of why Sam is so popular as a character, because he feels he feels real. He feels like a, a, a person that we might know. And uh, he is 
idealized in a way, but he's also idealized in a way that you think could be real. We might never come across an Aragorn in our lives, but we think we probably could come across a Sam Gamgee or two if we're lucky. So that is the history of uh, Sam Gamgee. Let's uh, have a quick flick through uh, the chat. Um, uh, let's, I think I had a, I think I had a super chat in here somewhere. Mm -mm. Or maybe I didn't. Oh yes, Roman Alakovets. Hi there. Um, saying, could you someday make a video about the 1978 animated Lord of the Rings movie? I'd love to hear your thoughts about it. Uh, yeah, why not? Um, I mean, I think some sort of a video about all of the different adaptations might be quite a fun thing to do. Um, Andrew Kay saying, so commendable, even when facing considerable self-doubt, Sam just always kept on staying the course. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's the um uh that's the beauty of the characters his bravery is is uh, i mean it's it's almost too obvious is that he never thought that he was good enough he never thought that he could achieve these things he just did what he thought was right um reflective rambling picking up a question for for lucian thank you i love it when people do this saying did the amount of time he spent with the ring have any lasting effects on sam as it did on frodo um i'd be interested in the post mordor effects well we don't read of it uh it's um i mean he'd lived for a reasonable amount of time um but uh, unlike Frodo, who clearly was affected, um, this I mean, this is quite a key part in in Frodo's life after the Lord of the Rings is that he was never really the same again. Uh, Sam seems not to have. I mean, we we don't get. It's worth saying, I think, that Tolkien doesn't give us huge details about what happens after the Lord of the Rings. It's just like the headlines. But I think the implication is that he he marries the love of his life. He has a lot of children. He gets the respect of his peers. Um, he lives in a beautiful place. He seems to live a, an amazing life. The, the I mean, we can sort of argue that the reason why he only did have it for a short period of time in the grand scheme of things. Um, but also, he is, out of all of the characters, the one possible exception of someone like Aragorn, who gets the ending that they deserve. And it's not, there's no kind of asterisk next to it. There's no, yeah, but he was deeply sad about something that happened. No, no, no. It's like he he went back to what he loved and stayed there loving it um with Merry and pippin we don't get much but they do seem to be they spend lots of time back in the shire but then in their old age when they are both widowers they set off back to rohan and gondor which kind of implies that there was always a part of them that aspired to be elsewhere not with Sam. You never got for one second the idea that he wanted to be anywhere else than Bag End with his family. So, um, yeah, he has a um, a wonderful rest of his life. I mean, I wish I could say some more that like we could see the impacts of the ring, but there just wasn't. Uh, Mara Lee, hi there, Mara, saying uh, for Sam and Rosie. Um, uh, let's have a quick flick through. Um, Carl Kostnark saying the fact that Sam can or does have a wonderful life, even after the hell he's been through, is a testament to overcoming trauma and war. Not unlike Jerry R.R. Tolkien himself, it can be done with friends and family. Yeah, I think that's probably worth noting. Um, is that Tolkien had he he did experience horrendous 
uh, things at war in the First World War, for those who don't know. Um, he never wrote extensively about it, but you can just feel the pain behind the words that he does write. Um, he says things like, um, uh, when I went to war, I went with how many, 20 of my best friends. When I returned home, all but two were dead. That's the kind of thing that it, you go, wow, that's horrific. And you lived through that. Um, but yeah, Tolkien lived a, a happy life after that. Um, I think Sam is perhaps the, the person that Tolkien would aspire to be. And I think Frodo would, in terms of sort of dealing with uh, all of that side of things, I think Frodo is the person that Tolkien definitely had an aspect of as well. The, the, the bit that the pain never goes away. Um, let's go to uh, Mara Lee, a question saying, fans of Tolkien's works praise Frodo as the hero, but I feel Samwise Gamgee should be equally praised. Um, if it wasn't for Sam's love for Frodo, I don't think Frodo would have been able to complete the journey and see the One Ring finally destroyed. Um, yes, agreed. And I just want to cover this idea of hero. Um, as I say, I've got a video which sort of builds on this uh, a little bit coming out at some point soon, but um Tolkien had a Tolkien obviously he was a professor of literature he was a, a student of how stories work mythologies work he understood the literary roles that we call now protagonist hero whatever and there is a difference between a protagonist and a hero um the protagonist is the person whose actions kind of drive forward the story uh, more than most other people's but heroes are the people that we root for and that makes there are lots of protagonists in the lord of the rings but that makes in the context of sam frodo more of the protagonist because he's the one he's the ring bearer but it makes sam the hero um, the, this is what Tolkien wrote in letter 131. If you if you only ever read one of Tolkien's letters, I would recommend letter 131, which came at a time when he was, um, it was just before the publishing of The Lord of the Rings. Um, and if you think back to the kind of situation there, so The Hobbit had been published, massive success. Let's write another book. Um, and so the publishers get him to write another book and he said, yeah, I'm nearly there, nearly there, but I really want, as well as this, this, uh, story, which is the Lord of the Rings, I've also got this detailed in-depth mythology history kind of work, Silmarillion, that I quite, I think we should publish that alongside this. And the publishers are like, yeah, I'm not so sure that that would really go down as well. Can't we just have the crack an old story um and so he writes him a letter uh, milton Maldron, who's the he was his publisher and he writes him this really long letter when he's setting out the history of everything he sets out the story of the lord of the rings he sets out that what we think of is like the, uh, the silmarillion and also a lot of the kind of the themes that are running through it all so you get a huge amount in there in, in letter 131 and one of the things that he says is this um I think the simple rustic love of Sam and his Rosie, nowhere elaborated, is absolutely essential to the study of his, brackets, the chief hero's character and to the theme of the relationship uh, and to the theme of the relation of ordinary life. So Tolkien is saying very clearly that the chief hero here is Sam. And that the the relation the the love between Sam and Rosie is essential to understanding how all of this kind of high fantasy stuff relates to ordinary real life. He's he sort of goes on. He talks a lot about sort of this very kind of highfalutin love stories of Aragorn and Arwen and things like that. But he he says that. 
all of this other stuff, it's grounded, really, by Sam. And that makes Sam the chief hero. Now, in kind of a classical literary style, also kind of covered by more modern understanding of things like the, uh, the hero's journey and the like, the story finishes when the hero returns home. And all is well-ish. Uh, it's not that they return and everything is exactly as it was before. Home will have changed in some way. Um, but the key point is that the story finishes when the hero gets home. And that is why the Lord of the Rings finishes with Sam returning home. Not when Frodo heads off uh, to the Blessed Realm. It finishes two or three pages later to, with Sam coming home and well, I'm back. So, yes, Sam is, in a very literary sense, the chief hero of The Lord of the Rings. And that's why we're supposed to emote with him. Um, Carl Karsnark saying, Frodo fails. It's only Gollum's uh, own even more greedy greed that saves anyone. Only Sam was able to give up the ring without some external help. Galadriel can can barely do it. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's the kind of thing that um, you can overlook, this kind of giving up of the ring. And, I mean, Frodo was very clear, give it to me, it's mine. Um, but Sam did. Uh, and Sam didn't need to give it up. Uh, Bilbo did give up the ring, but he tried not to. <laughs> he was pressured quite a lot by Gandalf to give up the ring uh, and you know, pretended that he'd given it up and started walking out with it still in his pocket. Bilbo went through all of the tricks. Frodo obviously never did. Um, uh, so, yeah, it's quite easy to... Um, kind of gloss over quite how important and impressive that moment was. What we don't see, just for a little bit of balance, so this isn't purely a Sam loving, what we don't see is what Sam would have been like in Mordor with the ring. It's very clear, Tolkien does make very clear, Kirith Angol is just, this is the watchtower just outside Mordor proper, and uh, Sam only had the ring inside, or just sat outside Mordor. So when you get into Mordor, it becomes very clear that for Frodo, the, the weight of the ring is even more impressive and oppressive. And when you get to the Cracks of Doom, that's when the power of the ring was at its strongest. So we're not comparing like for like when we're saying that um, uh, Sam managed to resist the pull of the ring, uh, but Frodo didn't in the end. This is this is different situations uh, but the one time you can only defeat the opponents put in front of you and the one time that Sam had the opportunity to keep hold of the ring he didn't and that is uh, impressive um, Mark Vane asking as a ring bearer will Sam have left for the Grey Havens or was it supposed to remain ambiguous he, he had the invite to go uh, to uh, the Grey Heavens. He, he did. He took it up in the end um, after Rosie had died um, and he handed the Red Book, the story of the Lord of the Rings, over to his daughter Eleanor. Um, that's when he headed off uh, from the Grey Heavens westwards. Um, he didn't have to. There was no impulse on him saying you must do this in the same way that we read, you know, Legolas probably is the best example when he he suddenly gets the sea longing and he can't he can hold on for a little bit, but he has to go. Uh, not so for Sam. He didn't have to go. It's just that the woman he loved had just died. Uh, his children had grown up. His life's work was complete and what did he want to do with his last few months, years, whatever of life? That was just to get to see his old friend again. Um, 
Andrew K pointing out that Tolkien does talk of his own Batman, also named Sam, and those types are the true heroes of such conflicts more than those who get the accolades. Yeah, so let's pick up on this. Um, so Batman is obviously a, a word or phrase that these days has slightly different connotations, but back in the time of... Uh, in Tolkien's time, time of say World War One, um, if you were a gentleman of some kind, um, then you would have, uh, and when I say a gentleman of some kind, what I mean is someone of a certain social class, uh, and when you went to war, you would have somebody of working class who would be there as your personal assistant. We shall put it um, in sort of more modern parlance. Um, they would, they would drive you places if you needed to be drive, driven places they would get you stuff maybe they would cook for you maybe they would you know look after you in other ways and Tolkien talks I haven't got the quote in front of me exactly but he basically says I looked around and I realized these guys were the real heroes um Tolkien just to sort of in terms of sort of his class when I sort of said you know of a certain social class. Tolkien did not start of a certain social class in life. Um, he uh, So he, he was born in South Africa, and then his father died there. The family had moved back, but his father died in South Africa. And basically he was adopted um, into the Catholic Church, is probably the wrong way of saying it. I'm sure there's a more technical way of saying this. Um, but uh, um, a priest within the Catholic Church sort of took him in and his clear academic genius was noticed early and so he got sent off to uh, university uh, with a view to a scholarship in the future and that kind of ele elevated him up to um, uh, the uh, sort of a, a higher social station than probably he might otherwise have been. If, if life had turned out slightly differently, then he probably would have been a Batman himself. Okay, let's go to um, uh, Philbert. Uh, this is a question from one of my patrons. Um, could you give a little information about the geography of Sam's uh, pre-ring life? From where and what hobbits would Sam have interacted with? Uh, for example, at the Green Dragon, or was there a market town in the Shire? Yeah, so uh, happy to talk about this a little bit. So the Shire is obviously not a massive place, but Sam never really got more than, as I said, about 20 miles from home. He was very focused in on where he lived, um, at Bagshot Row, um the as he was growing up he would play both with his children and with the cottons there's also a link there when i was talking about cotton wool as inspiration i think that's deliberate across from uh from tolkien so rosie was a cotton uh rosie cotton before she married uh, sam incidentally sam they they changed their name later or they were given a new name later for all the good work i didn't mention this uh, actually when i was doing the overview oh, probably i should have done sam spent a lot of time going around the shire and replanting it um and for this he was granted the surname gardener so he was no longer a gamji he was a gardener um, but anyway, uh, yeah, as a child, then he played with uh, a lot of the other local kids. And um, we know that Bilbo seemed to take um, a liking to him. The Green Dragon Inn was in Bywater, which was the next town along. We might call them a village, I suppose, these day days in some terms of size. This, uh, the, the Green Dragon was about, I think it was a mile, mile and a half from Hobbiton. Uh, so it was a little bit of a walk there, but this was, you know, you're going to your local pub and in the Green Dragon Inn, um, then you people from both Bywater and Hobbiton would mix. And so we don't see all the times that he was there. But he certainly seems to have been sat there at a table with, you know, his dad and his dad's friends. Um, not, you know, he said a few few things, but uh, clearly 
the elders were the people who had, you know, they were spouting their wisdom and then Sam and the younger people would be sort of listening a bit more. Um, uh, so in terms of are there markets and the like, we're not talking, Tolkien doesn't talk huge amounts about that side of things. It was a very agrarian uh, community. Um, clearly, uh, people did get goods from elsewhere in the Shire, so there clearly must be some kind of market system. The main town was Mickle Delving, um, uh, which uh, Sam spent a reasonable amount of time in in his later years, actually, because uh, he was the mayor, technically being the mayor of uh, the Shire, he was the mayor of Mickle Delving. Um, that's where they had the... Um, the closest thing to, to call kind of community buildings. Um, this was where the uh, the only couple of actual um, public offices were based. Uh, plus you had the Madam House, which was a sort of a cross between a storage house and a museum. This was where uh, Bilbo put things like uh, the mithril coat. Um, he just put it in the Madam House for people to look at, and nobody really, I mean, they might have looked at it and gone, well, that's pretty, but nobody realised quite how expensive and rare it was. Um, uh, but yeah, who, who he mixed with family, local families, uh, and then he sort of like, um, a little bit of exploring a bit wider. That's, that's the extent of his uh, sort of mix. Um, Callie Summers saying, what would the ring really have tempted Sam with? He didn't care to be the best gardener, but unlike Tom, the ring did have some pull on Sam. Uh, yeah, let's see whether I can try and find the link to this. Um, uh, maybe maybe I, I phew, might be asking too much. I've got my um, uh, Lord of the Rings up here in front of me. Um, right, here we go. Um I'll, I'll read. I'll read. This is the ring tempting Sam. Okay. Already the ring tempted him, gnawing at his will and reason. Wild fantasies arose in his mind, and he saw Samwise the Strong, hero of the age, striding with a flaming sword across the darkened land, and armies flocking to his call as he marched to the overthrow of Barador. Arada. And then all the clouds rolled away, and the white sun shone, and at his command the Vale of Gorgoroth became a garden of flowers and trees, and brought forth fruit. He only had to put on the ring and claim it for his own, and all this uh, could be. Um, but just to go on for a little bit, we then read, In that hour of trial it was the love of his master that helped most to hold him firm. But also, deep down in him lived still unconquered his plain hobbit sense. He knew in the core of his heart that he was not large enough to bear such a burden, even if such visions were not a mere cheat to betray him. The one small garden of a free gardener was all his need and due, not a garden swollen to a realm, his own hands to use, not the hands of others to command. So... That's what he was tempted with. He was tempted to, you know, he could be this great hero. He could take down anyone in his way. And then this whole realm could be a garden and I could have people doing the gardening for him. So that was what he was tempted with, um, which I think is pretty amazing, really, because that was actually, although it was a clear temptation, Sam could resist it and we're told how he could resist it first of all his love for frodo was there but then secondly um he didn't want it although that was the temptation actually he felt all i want is my own small garden i want to do the gardening not control others who do the gardening and that says i think a lot about the temptation of the ring because the ring takes on Sauron's character. Sauron poured himself into that ring. So this isn't just like a, a magical item in and of itself. This is 
Sauron in a way. And Sauron was all about control and power. And so that was what made sense to uh, be trying to tempt Sam with. You could be in control of all of this all of this land as a garden with lots of gardeners working to you. But that actually wasn't what Sam was like. And we don't read so much at that level of detail, the, the ring tempting someone like Bilbo, say, or Frodo. But I think we have to assume that it's the same kind of idea. Whatever they did want, they were being offered it but in a very kind of controlling way. And that was what helped hobbits to resist it. Hobbit, good old hobbit sense, as Tolkien put it. Uh, that was, it's just like, I don't, I don't actually want that. Yeah, I could understand why people might think I want that, but I don't actually want that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, Lola Tov saying, an ancient king of the reach. Yeah, that's exactly uh, there. Um, da, 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 da. Mara Lee, uh, thank you for the super chat. I didn't see a question attached to that one. Um, uh, Derry's read it before saying, I wonder if the ring saw Sam's vision and was confused as heck. Well, yeah, quite possibly. Um, let's go to a question from uh, Matthew Hawkins. How much divine intervention was going on with Sam? I have recently listened to the Lord of the Rings audiobook again and really felt that whilst the hobbits were in Mordor, Sam was being driven on by a stronger, pardon me, stronger metaphysical power. Now, I would love to know your thinking of this, um, uh, listening again to it. Um, the 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 feel reading behind the words of the of the lord of the rings is that yes there clearly is another plan going on here um gandalf talks about things of what are, what is meant to be Fro you know, bilbo was meant to find the ring he was meant to pass it on to frodo that kind of thing gollum has has a role to play yet so there is this kind of sense of something overall kind of uh, mastering events, which fits in, of course, with the way that Tolkien's world and legendarium is set up. Uh, this does have a, a one god who isn't overly engaged with the world. Engaged is probably the wrong word, but doesn't... Um, doesn't get involved directly in what's going on over the world in the third age at least hugely uh, but you do see this from time to time the sending back of gandalf was clearly Ulu Uluvatar. um the uh, the role of the hobbits specifically and genuine generally is clearly something that is an ineffable plan um uh, Elrond gives his little speech about, you know, I see that now is the time, uh, the small folk of the Shire, um, that, that, is, um, that is him just perceiving a little bit of the wider plan. Um, so I would love to know what aspects you saw there, particularly in Mordor, uh, because what we tend to focus in on as far as Sam is concerned, it's his, his own personal bravery, his own actions. He was the one uh, there saving Frodo, Frodo uh, feeding Frodo, uh, carrying Frodo. Um, it, he takes on a lot more of a proactive role. In, in fact, he becomes more of a protagonist the closer towards the end of the story that we get. When we, we start out, then he is sort of going along with the rest of it. And yes, he's clearly saying, I'm not leaving Frodo alone, but he's he's carrying along with the rest of the group. By the time it's just him and Frodo, and Frodo's will starts sapping, that's when Sam starts taking the lead, deciding um, on uh, what they should each, which, you know, 
direction they're going in sometimes literally carrying Frodo he he takes on more of the protagonist role um Username Redacted, was Tolkien inspired by anyone in his life for the loyalty or friendship of Samwise? Uh, yeah, I mean, certainly in the First World War, he does mention, I think it was, um, and Andrew mentioned it earlier in the chat, actually, uh, that uh, his, his assistant, his Batman, um, was an inspiration. But he doesn't say that this is... That was Sam. That specific person there is Sam. Um, it's more a, um, uh, a creation of what a hobbit is like. Um, and another thing that he said um, when talking about Sam is that whereas Bilbo is very much in the hobbit he is our hobbit representative. He is the person who is there showing us what hobbits are like. Um, when we get to the Lord of the Rings, that role is taken on more by Sam um, because Frodo increasingly is weighed down by the ring and so who he is is affected by that. Uh, we get Pippin, who is very clearly much younger, so not yet a fully grown hobbit. Um, and we have Merry, who is often like the counterpart to, uh, to Pippin. But Sam... Sam is representative representative of uh, hobbits more generally. Um, uh, Martin S saying, "Good evening, Robert. You look less tired tonight than on the live stream a week ago." Well, thank you very much. Um, uh, maybe I've been getting more early nights, um, but uh, I'll, I'll take that as a compliment. Um, and I will just very, very quickly pause, actually, um, uh, and just say, uh, I don't know whether you've noticed this, but hang on. Uh -uh. That is merch. And I always forget to talk about merch, but we're coming towards Christmas and it is time for Christmas jumpers or Christmas sweaters. Um, and this is a Christmas T-shirt. Uh, but... Uh, lovely design. I didn't design it myself, so I can say it's a lovely design. Um, if you would like that, uh, there will be, I think somewhere down there um, is a link to uh, the, the shop where you can buy that uh, and sport your Christmas. I think it comes in a variety of colours um, and not just in t-shirts, in other things as well. Uh, so if you're interested in that, do go and check that out. And at the moment, there is 20% off. So now is the time to go and check that out. Um, uh, what else is to say? Patrons, thank you. Um, I always say thank you to my patrons. It's because I... I owe them me being able to do this. So patrons, thank you. I hugely appreciate you. Moderators, I thank you as well. I hugely appreciate you. Um, if you are here in the chat watching live, please show them a little bit of love. Uh, the chat is um, the kind of the, the happy and uplifting and safe place that it is because of the moderators. I can't check every message because I'm talking all the way through this, but the moderators do that. Uh, so uh, thank you very much. Um, right, where were we up to? Let's go to a question from uh, Mara Lee. Galadriel gave to the Fellowship gifts to take on their journey. One of the gifts that Sam received was a small box of dirt or dust from Galadriel's garden. Did she honour him with this gift? simply because he had been Frodo's gardener, or were there other reasons he received it? Well, there's um, there's an immediate reason, and then there's a longer-term reason. Uh, yes, she gave it to him because she knew that he was a gardener and he loved nature, and um, knew that he would treasure that as a gift. Um, the immediate reason, I think, was he did see in the Mirror of Galadriel he saw the Shire being destroyed, basically. We see this in when we get to the scour of the Shire much later. Um, trees were being uprooted. Um, the beautiful, bucolic, rural lifestyle was being destroyed. 
Sam's on the verge of wanting to head home. And I think Galadriel, she knows what he sees. And when she gives him a gift later, it's something he's decided he's going to carry on anyway. But he's clearly breaking his heart, what's going on in the Shire. And she gives him this gift knowing that this will help him replant and rebuild the Shire afterwards. So uh, that's the sort of the, the, the short term thing is a reaction to what he saw in the mirror of Galadriel. The longer term thing is we get a reasonably good description of, of what happens afterwards. After the scouring of the Shire, we get um, Sam going all around the Shire where where there was damage and he would take just like a grain or a pinch of this dirt dust and he would when he was replanting saplings or whatever he would put something some of that in there and where the party tree was at the heart of the shire i mean this is now the big tree and he had an acorn as part of that uh, sort of the box there from galadriel and acorn and that grew into a malorn tree which is the type of tree they had at the heart of um, Lothlorien that had its its roots, pun intended, going all the way back to uh, the Undying Lands. And as a result, very swiftly, you know, unnaturally swiftly, the Shire grew back to the beautiful place that it used to be. And in fact, it was better. It wasn't the same, but it was, it was beautiful. And we're told that for the next few years the harvests were bountiful and so basically galadriel was giving sam passing on to sam if you want to get even more meta about this she she knew at that point she gave the little speech about you know your coming to us is like the footsteps of doom is that either way we're doomed here in Lothlorien. Lothlorien's going. Uh, if you if you don't destroy the ring, then Sauron's going to destroy us. If you do destroy the ring, then my ring of power loses its power and Lothlorien will eventually fade. Uh, so she knew Lothlorien was dying and would die. And she knew that I suspect that she would get on that boat heading west. And so she wishes to make sure that someone can just keep this spark of beauty, of, of connection to nature going in Middle Earth. And so she hands that on to Sam, not with any great fanfare, not saying, I give you this, which will, you know, this is a an acorn for the Malon tree. The Malon tree is that she doesn't give him all the history. She just gives him it knowing, knowing what he will do, knowing he will use it wisely. And uh, I think that's a beautiful moment there. It's, um, it's quite telling. You know, the rest of the fellowship get these gifts that will be useful for them in their journey. He gets something which will be useful afterwards. Um, uh, Martin S. Did J.R.R. Tolkien live in Oxford while he was writing The Lord of the Rings? I can't remember with certainty, but I believe he probably did. Yes, yes, he did. I was in Oxford actually just a few months ago, um, uh, and I should put some pictures up. I think I can't remember if I've put any pictures of it up actually. Um, and it was great going back to, um, I've been to Oxford many times, but uh, yeah, going to his favourite tree in the botanical gardens there um, is, is a, a thing of beauty. And um, there are two two pubs near near where he used to um, uh, be in as a lecturer in a professor in Oxford. Uh, the Lamb and Flag has recently, in the last year or so, reopened. Um, so I happily had lunch and a fine a pint of their finest local ale there um and just over the road from that is the eagle and child the eagle and child um 
I am very happy to tell you, if you have not heard the news, has uh, we've not got all the details yet, but uh, it's been shut for a while, and it has now recently been bought out by uh, some uh, company, I think it is, uh, who are looking to reopen it as a pub, um, as well as other I think conferencing facilities or something but they're they're wanting to make sure that it can reopen which is fantastic news um don't know all the details yet but if that's true that is excellent and for those who are wondering about why that is particularly excellent news about those two pubs it's um tolkien was in uh what has to be uh one of the the finest certainly one of the most famous writing groups ever uh called the inklings now, the Inklings, the, the, the two most famous members are, are Tolkien himself and C.S. Lewis, but they had other people, Dorothy L. Sayers, who you may know, and several other people that sort of were, were members on and off over the years. And it was in those pubs, um, particularly the Eagle and Child, where Tolkien and Lewis would read each other the stories of Middle Earth and Narnia and critique each other. Uh, so they have got a hugely important part of literary history um so yeah anyway uh, yes he was in uh, he was in oxford when he was writing uh reflective rambling saying love and positive positive vibes for chloe leanne pretty please uh, absolutely sorry i may have missed something um in the chat uh or i just seen chloe leanne the best of breaks, tough day as a vet nurse, they happen, but the properly rubbish ones stick. Thanks for the love, amazing community, and you guys are a big reason for that. Well, um, I don't know everything that happened today, but uh, yeah, uh, love and positive vibes to you. If you're, if you're a vet, then um, uh, yes, yeah, I can imagine you can, you can have some bad days uh, with that. Um, yeah, Dan was the vet only a few days ago, but thankfully he's okay. Um, Let's go to a question from uh, Kelly Summers. I was wondering if you could talk a bit about how you approach the sometimes thorny questions about applying our current social ideas to literary works. For Sam, this has to do with both class structure and personal relationships. For example, I very much doubt that Tolkien intended a queer reading of Frodo and Sam's relationship, and the story works fine whether you read it as brotherly love or courtly love. Uh, even if I have a hard time not seeing the romantic language. But I don't know how to get around the class dynamic for all the talk about an idyllic, everyone's equal vibe of the Shire. It's not like Frodo would ever address Sam as Mr. Sam. Sam is reliable, trusted and loved like family, but not really a partner or an equal. How do you personally find the balance between not overly judging a work based on modern understanding and not giving too much of a free pass to a work that we all love? Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's a tricky one, but the way I kind of approach it, particularly for Tolkien, is this, um, is that Tolkien, um, certainly at, at the beginning when he was writing um, about his world, he intended this to be uh, a mythology for England and the hither parts of Europe, which is, I, I think he means sort of Northwestern Europe. Um, and, and I think that is quite important because uh, he was wanting this to be mythology. And he had a very clear understanding of mythology. Um, and mythology is not like a, a written down story. Mythology is something which is passed on by a culture, uh, often through an oral tradition, uh, generation to generation, and the culture takes applications for itself from that mythology, from those stories. And we often talk about this. I mean, Tolkien regularly talked about uh, his dislike of allegory. He cordially disliked allegory in all its forms. Um, and talked about how he hoped that the Lord of the Rings would be applicable to people, by which he means uh, that he hasn't written specific messages in there, but he has tried to have themes that people can then interpret and reinterpret as the ages go by. Now, 
I will give an example here of just a, a bit of mythology. As we're talking about English mythology, which is what Tolkien was talking about, we have as an example that most people know Robin Hood. Robin Hood, um, as a mythology, emerged somewhere around the 12th century, maybe. Um, and uh, at some point, it's the adventures of Robin Hood got written down. There was um, uh, lots of tales that sort of started to emerge, what we might call a sort of a canon of Robin Hood stories. But these were mostly passed down as stories from one person to another, oral traditional stories. And as a result, the, the way that people interpreted them did change and shift through the ages, depending on what the, 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 I mean, the spirit of the age is probably the wrong way of saying it, but depending on the situation at the time. Was Robin Hood uh, a member of the landed gentry, uh, Sir Robert of Loxley, um, uh, or was he um, a thief, a, 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 an outlaw of some kind, uh, Robin in the Hood? Was he a more sort of ethereal, magical figure associated with uh, the Green Man and other kind of uh, more mythical um, uh, elements? Uh, was he somebody who cared about social justice? Uh, we think of like Robin Hood taxes as being taken from the rich to give to the poor. Uh, all of these different aspects of the mythology of Robin Hood passed down through the years and some bits at some times were emphasized and some bits at other times were emphasized and that is how mythology works and Tolkien knew that and understood that and that was what he was intending so um how we approach this I think is to say yes. We we want he he wrote this as a written piece of work that should definitely be preserved. But at the same time, we have to accept. And Tolkien himself said what he initially his his idea was that um, other minds and hands should have at this world should be able to add extra stories and things to it. He wanted this um, uh, to be something that other people could start to add to to emphasize in different ways. So I think that's where we need to be with Tolkien in order to respect what he was wanting for this story. Um, uh, what does that mean in terms of certain interpretations? Just to take the the one that you were uh, you were talking about there about the relationship between Sam and Frodo. Um, now you can probably guess as well as I would what. Tolkien with his very mid 20th century Catholic morality would have thought about the idea of uh, there being sort of a, a gay over or under text to this. But at the same time, if we treat it in the way that he wants us to treat it, then I think that it is a perfectly reasonable and there are many perfectly reasonable interpretations of a text that one can take that to make it applicable to oneself. And so that, I think, is the way that Tolkien wanted us to interpret stories, not just his story, but stories, myths in particular. I hope that kind of all added up and made sense. Um, it's it's sometimes a tricky issue, um, but I think... Um, I, I think we, if we take the step back and try and approach this in the way that Tolkien wanted us to approach it, um, then I think it actually gets to be a lot easier. Um, uh, Andrew Kay saying, I don't get too hung up on such things. Of course, you have to factor in time it was written and intent, uh, be it Tolkien or older classics. I tried to find the timeless themes and elements. Yeah, I think that uh, as is often the case, uh, people in the chat sum up uh, these things um, uh, a lot better than I can. Uh, right, let's go to um, a question from... Uh, the chat seems to be discussing the, diff what, the difference between old money and new money, um, which I'm 
I suspect is a, a, an offshoot from what I've just been talking about. Okay. Um, let's go to a question from Mara Lee. George R. R. Martin uh, often takes inspiration from other stories for his books. Fans of both The Lord of the Rings and A Song of Ice and Fire often like to compare Sam Gamgee with Jon Snow's friend Sam Tarwell. Um, could you compare and contrast these characters with their friendships to Frodo and Jon Snow? Is it just that their name is similar or is it something different? So, yeah, I'm very happy to um, uh, sort of unpack this. Uh, George R. R. Martin, uh, I, I often write videos that uh, the sort of pick up on things he said about the, the Lord of Things and kind of pick holes in them, which is unfair of me. Um, but I always try to emphasize that uh, he is a massive fan of the Lord of the Rings. Um, I defy anyone to find a long interview with him when he does not mention Tolkien or the Lord of the Rings. He's obsessed with it. He really, really is. Um, the the link between Sam Gamgee and Sam Tarly is there. He has basically admitted as much. Um, uh, if you're not a, a Song of Ice and Fire Game of Thrones fan, then perhaps you, you don't know the kind of the two characters, but they are both, they're the friend of a main character. Both are loyal, both are good-hearted, uh, both are perhaps... Uh, slightly uh, rotund and not particularly athletic in uh, their appearance. Both uh, probably don't claim to be brave, but do incredibly brave things. Um, both have this great moral compass. Uh, so there's a lot of uh, crossover between the two of them. Something which is probably not uh, noticed as much also is if you're a Song of Ice and Fire fan, you may well, not, I only noticed this relatively recently, uh, but he also has surrounded Jon Snow with Pip, Pippin, and Dolorous Ed, who you could say is a sort of an antonym for Merry, being Dolorous. Um, so he has kind of created this little fellowship around uh, Jon Snow. Um, what all of this does bring me to, though, which I think is the main point here, is what does that therefore make Jon Snow in A Song of Ice and Fire if he is surrounded by Sam, Merry, and Pippin? Um, does that make him Frodo? And as I've said uh, many times before, I personally believe that George R. R. Martin is writing Jon Snow as if he is Aragorn, uh, this uh, long-promised, prophesied king, uh, here to save the day, uh, but in reality, Jon Snow is Frodo, uh, by which I mean that he is going to be a main protagonist. He's going to uh, achieve much. His actions are going to be what saves the land uh, as much as anyone else's are, uh, and he will survive, but he is going to be so scarred by this process that um, uh, that he can't live in this new world that he has saved, and he has to go north at the end. They did that on the Game of Thrones TV show. Pretty much the last scene, I think, was him heading off north. I think that that is an echo of Frodo heading off to the west, um, and I think that we will see something very similar in the books. Um I did have another point to make about that, but I can't remember what it was now. Oh, well. Um, so the, the short answer is that, yes, Sam uh, Samuel Tarly is very much a deliberate play on Sam Wise Gamgee. Um, I mean, the, the names are obviously similar, but the, the characters are also there. Um Andrew K saying, Mara Lee, did Robert call out your name day earlier? I was getting some lag on and off before. Happy name day again. Um, I didn't know, but uh, Mara Lee, happy name day. I, I know it was uh, it was a couple of days ago. Um, I hope you had a fantastic day. Um, the... Uh, duh, 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 duh. Kelly Summers saying, thank you for digging deep on the question. Yeah, you're very welcome. Um, 
Reflective Rambling saying Tolkien seems to be a man of peace and humanity as much as a scholar. Uh, I think if anything, even if it wasn't keen for him, he'd want us to find peace and interest overall. Yeah, he, he was um, a, a man of peace and humanity, I think is a good way of saying it. He, he, definitely, he definitely was. Uh, and a love, a love for the planet. Um, Kelly Summers, thank you very much for the super sticker. Um, okay, let's go to um, a question from... Um, I, I've only got uh, two more questions, actually. This might be a shorter live stream today, uh, but happy to pick through as many questions as I can in the chat. Two more questions for my patrons. Kelly Summers, uh, when or how did Sam learn his basic survival or fighting skills? Hobbits seem like they would uh, enjoy hiking through nature, but prefer to come home to a nice warm bed instead of camping in a tent. He's not a great fighter. I suppose he could have watched Aragorn and Boromir and got some training in Rivendell while waiting for months. But I was wondering if there's anything in the text or Sam's background that will make him moderately competent with that kind of thing. Um, uh, so, I mean, I think the short answer is yes. Hobbits are not there. They're not there as being the, um, the great fighters. Now, is there any reason to think that Sam would naturally be better than any of the other hobbits? I mean, maybe some reasons. Yes, I think we could speculate that uh, he spent a lot of time just sort of like learning weapon skills from Aragorn or something, and, and that's entirely possible. Maybe that happened. Um, we don't see him in combat much, but when we do, his tactic seems to be uh, just to sort of rush in from the side and hack at something so he rushes in when the watcher in the water is there with his tentacle grabbing frodo then he hacks at a tentacle um when uh an orc gets a sort of a big i can't remember what it was a spear type thing and starting to uh, try and go at frodo then he hacks down at the on the on the spear um i mean there's a common theme there he's basically trying to defend frodo but he's not like getting in the way he's not doing hand-to-hand -hand combat he is very clearly um sort of coming in and just sort of like trying to make a difference so uh there's nothing to suggest that he is a great fighter uh there's nothing really even to suggest that he's a very competent fighter but he's brave um and he sort of times his interventions now uh what else can we say in terms of compared to the other hobbits? So the Sam is clearly he wasn't brought up as a fighter. Um, the hobbits don't have a particularly martial lifestyle. Um, when they need to, uh, they kind of like rustle up a few troops. The Thane um, uh, does that. Uh, so Sam, if I were to make a if I were to make a case for Sam uh, being a good fighter then it, or a better fighter than the other hobbits, then it would probably be that the the other three hobbits are they're part of the landed gentry. They're from three of the the oldest, wealthiest, and most well known families in the Shire. Um, they don't seem to do much work. Um, it's probably fair to say uh, the. Frodo doesn't seem to have a day job. Um, Sam does. Sam is a gardener. He spends his day outdoors. Um, he's very practical. He knows rope making. Um, he will have had to mow the lawn. This is before, like, nice modern lawn mowers. He will have had to sort of mow the lawn. Um, he will have been used to wielding sharp uh knives and things uh so if i had to sort of construct a defense he's probably more handy and probably more outdoorsy um no yes he absolutely would prefer to be sitting snuggled up at home somewhere but um if he's going to go and travel the 20 miles or so away from hobbiton then he will have had to sort of stay outdoors sometimes so uh that's 
that's the, the best defense I can construct, but I don't think Tolkien writes him as a particularly strong fighter. I think we're supposed to see him as somebody who um, does the best with what he's got. Kirsty Angel saying, happy name day, Mara Lee. Yes, happy name day again. Um, uh, Reflective Rambling saying, who's a bigger Tolkien fan, George R. Martin or John Oliver? Uh, well, George R. R. Martin. I mean, I don't know. Is, is John Oliver a, a massive Tolkien fan? Um, that other American chat show host whose name I forget definitely is a big Tolkien fan. Um, Kaius Bellarina, how do you think his kids and grandkids felt about him ditching them to die uh, with a man that they hardly or ever knew? Um, I mean, we're not really told, but I, th I think... The, the way it's written is that he he lived a long life. Um, I think he was like 102, maybe, um, when... I've got it written down here somewhere. Uh, bear with me. Um, yes, 102. Uh, well remembered, Robert. Um, so he was um, uh, 102 at the point that he sailed off to the West. Um, he led a long life. He'd, uh, he'd been married for over half a century. Uh, he'd been mayor of Mickledelving for nearly half a century. Um, he'd had 13 children who had all by that time grown up. Um, and his other life's work, uh, writing some of and curating uh, the Red Book, was done uh he under his um leadership is probably the best way to say it the the shire's um boundaries were set and expanded their um agreement with the wider world was set in stone he had achieved everything and i think um i think i think probably his family would have been okay with it the the one that we know who who knew he was doing it anyway was Eleanor, his eldest daughter, who he handed the red book onto, and she, um, uh, she then kept hold of it and curated it from then on, and she clearly was, uh, well, by implication, was brought into this idea of an understanding of the history there. So, um, yeah, I don't think that anyone in his family would have felt betrayed in any way by him heading off. I think that at the age of 102, and yes, hobbits do sometimes live for uh, longer, uh, but 102 was a full life. And if he said, I want to head off west, then I think they would have probably all given it their blessing. Um Derry's read it before saying, have you ever met a weak gardener? Gardening is hard physical labor. He may look pudgy, but Sam will be solid. Um, yeah, I think I would definitely agree with that. Um, uh, Stephen Colbert. There we go. Thank you, people, uh, for reminding me. Um, who's a bigger fan, George R. Martin or Stephen Colbert? Um, from the little I've seen of, uh, of uh, Colbert, talking about this, I think probably him, um, for the simple reason that um, George R. R. Martin adores Tolkien, uh, but he also talks a lot about other things that he adores, whereas I think I've only ever heard um, Stephen Colbert talking about The Lord of the Rings, but maybe that's just because that's what the algorithm wants to show me. Um, uh, Quick, I'm just flicking through the chat here. Um, uh, Bilbo, Cole Kostnark saying Bilbo is chosen to be a thief, not a fighter. Two different skill sets. Uh, yes, definitely. Um, uh, Daniel Dipka saying, look, if my parents want to move to Florida, good for them. They earned it. Um, yeah, I guess that's, that's a, a modern analogy for it. Uh, Homebody saying Sam had finished his work. 
Um, Andrew Case saying, John Oliver is, I believe, a Liverpool fan, so probably doesn't have the taste for Tolkien. Uh, <laughs> you may say that. I couldn't possibly comment, but you're obviously right. Um, let's go to... Um, Caius Bellerina, Mark Shisa question. Thank you for picking this up. Uh, as mayor, what were Sam's tax policies? Ah, I do get asked this quite a lot. So um, the Shire is a low tax communitarian um, uh, land, it has to be said. The, there, there is not much that the well, there is not much of a central infrastructure to start with, and there is not much spending and therefore need for tax. Now, uh, there are two, only two um, official uh, sort of services, public services in the Shire, um, one of which are the sheriffs, those basically the sort of the policemen and border guards, um, and the other are the postmen. Um, you can get post across the Shire very quickly. Now, um, the, the third thing that we're told, which was part of their original agreement uh, with um, the Kingdom of Arnor, and the assumption is that this was kept as an agreement uh, with Aragorn, but we're not told, is to uh, keep upkeep the roads and the bridges. Now, uh, the role of mayor of Mickle Delving didn't seem to come with any staff. It didn't seem to have any particular expenses to it. Basically, you were inv invited to a lot of parties and had to give you short speeches, and that was it. Hobbits don't like long speeches, and they don't really like much by way of administration. So, uh, all that said, uh, the need for taxes in the Shire is extremely low. Uh, some of those services may well be you know, be able to be paid for themselves, like the postal service. Um, you could well imagine paying, you know, if you've got a courier coming to you and you can pay them for that service there and then. So I, I think that that we hear nothing of, and Tolkien doesn't like talking about this kind of stuff anywhere, but we hear nothing of income taxes or anything like that. Uh, toll bridges were definitely a thing uh, in the wider world. Um, but also there was a huge amount of community working together for stuff. Um, when you did have a big party at the party tree, then it seems to be everybody just came together and um, brought stuff or helped erect tents or uh, things like that. So um, my my general take is low tax, if any tax, uh, and low public spending. Uh, which um, I should probably say is not there, does not therefore mean, just to sort of put the balance on this one, does not mean that in our modern understanding of these things that makes it some sort of a capitalist ideal because it is not, it is very much communitarian. Um, the reason why they don't have all of these public services is because local families and areas and people would look after themselves. So if there was a dispute in a, an area, then that would be dealt with by the family. If the family themselves could not sort it out, then it would go to like the the, the noble family of the area, um, the Brandy Bucks or the Tooks or whoever it is, uh, and they would sort it out. So uh, that's the uh, the sort of the, the structure of the world. It's a, there's not much of a state infrastructure. Um, uh, da, 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 da. Let's go to a question from uh, Kieran McGee. I have a thought that Sam and Faramir are written in parallel. Loyalty or duty? Faramir's I do not love the sword and uh, Sam relinquishing every powerful item he has. Faramir regrowing a thillion and Sam regrowing the shire yes yeah, so, well certainly there's a um a love of nature uh there with both of them the gardens there uh, for faramir in athelion uh, although those those were the actual gardening was done by elves they um 
they do have an echo of two really good characters. Faramir, incidentally, doesn't come across as well in uh, in the films. In the books, he doesn't he doesn't really get tempted by the ring. He figures out what's going on, and then he says, "No, you need to be off on your way." He doesn't capture them and say, "I need to take you back to my father." Um, that was at the time that was quite a controversial thing for um, proper. Tolkien fans, I say proper Tolkien fans, you know what I mean, uh, back in the day. Um, but, uh, yeah, are they echoes of each other? To a degree, I suppose, in in as much as there's only two characters or character types that I can think of that Tolkien's ever said that it's like him. Um, one is Faramir, and he says, um, in as much as any character is like me, it is Faramir. Um, and he's also said uh, about hobbits that he is, um, to all intents and purposes, a hobbit himself in all but size. So he clearly is the link between these two. Um, and if he sees a bit of himself in both, or a lot of himself in both of those two, then yes, there is a sort of a, a character link uh, across from them. I suspect that Tolkien didn't write it as a deliberate echo um, or contrast between the two. Uh, but um, yes, I can see where the, the, the thinking comes from. Um, uh, Kelly Summers saying, I don't think George R. R. Martin can recite the Lord of the Rings songs from memory. Agreed Weirwood saying Stephen Colbert practically has it memorized. He wins contests against Tolkien fans. Um, well, he sounds like quite the guy. Uh, so there we go. I've, I've, all of my thinking about this sounds like it was uh, it was unnecessary. Because um, uh, Bay saying there, and an, this is the Hobbits, they are an anarcho syndicalist commune. Um, well, I should take your word for that. I, I mean, I think there's, uh, as much as I enjoy breaking into the detail of tax policies of, of um, different fantasy worlds, there is a, uh, I think there's a limit, particularly when you come to Tolkien, uh, when he didn't think about or really want to think too much about the economics of his world. And he happily mentions that he he happily says, you know, I don't I don't have an exact quote from him, but he he basically says I don't uh, I, I care about the words, I care about the languages, I care about the histories, I care about the mythologies, I care about the story, uh, but the economics of it not so much. Uh, so I think there is a limit to how much we can uh, uh, do that, but. Um, uh, Anarcho-syndicalist commune sounds sounds good, uh, although how anarcho they are, I don't quite know. Um, Carl Karsnark saying the tater tax is all Sam cares about. Imagine putting a tax on potatoes. Um, terrible. Um, Kars Ballerina, uh, what is up with the shade that Joe uh, Tolkien gave Sam with his Westron name? Uh, from the wiki, it says Sam's name is Banazir Gelbasi, also spelt Gelpsi. Banazir comes from elements meaning half-wise or simple. Um, well, I think uh, that uh, this is me digging into the dredges of my memory, but I think that what Tolkien is doing here is then allowing us to come to our own conclusions. Sam is supposed to be set up as simple, rustic is, is a word that Tolkien uses for him. Uh, the language he used, Tolkien obviously is big on language. Um, someday when you're bored, compare the poems and the songs in The Lord of the Rings. You can tell who wrote them in world by the language usage. Uh, you And Sam's are the simplest word usage possible, but that doesn't mean that they're not insightful or beautiful. 
Uh, and I think that that is what Tolkien is wanting us to be starting out thinking, oh, this is just like some simple hired hand, not that clever or wise. But by the end of it, we should be thinking, actually, yeah, he is. <laughs> Uh, this is the wisest and best of them all. Uh, so I and I think you will get there's a, a not published. I think it was never published. It, it probably appears in in the history of Middle Earth that Christopher Tolkien uh, sort of uh, amassed and edited later. Uh, a letter from Aragorn to Sam after yeah, you know, well he's mayor and. Um, I think it's in there when it says um, uh, the uh, half wise or it, it should actually be very wise or something along those lines. He uh, he recognized Tolkien gives him a name that makes you think that he's not that special or clever. But by the end of it, you as a reader can recognize the falsity of that. Um, uh, Carl Karsnark saying small government conservatism. Um, yeah, feel free to try and um, uh, come up with a, a, a name for what this is. Uh, Sam Gamgee's uh, sort of um, tax system. Um, Let's go. So I've got one more question from my patrons. Um, and then I will pick up on uh, questions in the chat. Actually, actually, just very quickly, Terra Incognita, can most hobbits read? We're not told. I think the implication is no. Um, uh, because Sam has to be taught to read by... Uh, Bilbo. The the problem we have is that the the main characters are all these upper class landed gentry, who of course can all read. But um, one suspects that the vast majority of people in the Shire they can probably read a bit, but not certainly not other languages. Um, uh, Let's go to so last question for my patrons, Commander Ray. Uh, potatoes, how do you like them, Robert? My favorite is mashed with gravy on top. Um, in connection to the food, do you think Sam's love of food saved Middle Earth? And do you think Sauron just needed a good meal to calm down? Well, um, how I like my potatoes, I, I am partial to um, a good roasted potato, it has to be said, uh, or chips. Um, that's British chips. Um, uh, which are not the same as French fries, much chunkier. Um, but uh, mashed potato with gravy on top mm, sounds lovely. Uh, do do I think that Sam's love of food saved Middle Earth? Um, I mean, I think this is the kind of thing I could probably write a whole long video about. He is the, I think his love of practicalities and uh, his service... His his heart full of service, I think, was what saved Middle Earth. Um, by which I mean that he's um, he's the one who remembers to bring the pots and pans and uh, loads up Bill, and uh, he's um, the one who starts bemoaning his lack of rope because he thinks, oh, that will turn out to be useful later. He's the one who um, thinks about rationing the food when he wonders whether or not he and Frodo can make it to Mount Doom and back. His eminent practicality is incredibly important. Uh, sometimes they obviously have other quite practical people out there like Aragorn, uh, but um it's certainly when you got to Mordor, if if Frodo had had somebody um less focused in on uh food, uh then um perhaps they wouldn't have made it through. And incidentally, they he nearly gave them away. In the books, um 
finally Sam gives in and says, well, we need to cook something. And he did, does start cooking. It might have been the conies at that point. Um, and his the smoke from the fire is what attracts Faramir and his rangers. Uh, okay, so that's th all the questions from my patrons. Um, let's have a quick flick through the chat. Uh, Kaziglu Bay saying, I'm out for tonight. See you all next week. Great to um, see you. Um, Derry's read it before saying, Spuds in all their forms are things of beauty. Roasted, chipped, boiled, mashed, uh, baked, fried vodka. Um, uh, so uh, great to uh, see a bit of potato love going on in the... the um chat um kieran mcgee saying great to hear from you thanks for the work i look forward to thursday commute listening to you on the way in um you're very welcome indeed carl karsnack saying crisps are chips uh, uh i i i will agree to disagree on that one agreed we would saying british chips are more like steak fries um i will, will take your word for it um, no tater taxation without representation. Nice. Um, okay, so um, Carl Karsnark saying, I can't imagine Gerard Tolkien writing or glorifying illiteracy in Hobbits. That's orc behavior. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, I don't think, having sort of said, I think many probably didn't write. I think, I, I think sort of looking at labels and sort of a small amount yes but the sort of the the great literary uh style is very much the sort of the upper class thing there um uh, in the shire it's an interesting one let me have a think about that one actually how many people in the shire actually could uh uh, uh read and write um Andrew K saying, I've inspired a Lord of the Rings audiobook listen by a fellow member of House K, Zach K. Well, great to hear that, uh, Zach K. Um, uh, right, I think with that, um, Mara Lee saying, Thank you for the birthday shout out. You're very welcome. Um, uh, with that, I will start drawing this one to a close. A reminder if you would like your IDG swag, your Christmas swag uh somewhere i think down there will be a link to it um also what have we got coming up um i've got uh, another few videos in the the northern plot line in a song of ice and fire coming out soon um and uh yeah i don't know i've got some more talking ones uh, I, I forget what i've been working on but uh there's lots more coming out also the short form videos uh, on this channel, IDG Live, have uh, started back up again. So uh, keep an eye out for that. And as I say, uh, you can find me now all over the place if if you want to find me on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, uh, X. I'm in lots of different places. So uh, keep an eye out for me there. Um, but, but with that, I will be back next week um, with... Uh, let's go back to one of the northern houses. Maybe we'll do House of Reed next week. Um, I know that's something that people have been asking for. Uh, but for now, uh, take care, everyone, and I will see you again soon.